All right, film class, we're back at it. It is I, Dr. Steve McQueen here on, well, recording on Tuesday, but this will be covering our topic for tomorrow, which is Wednesday, April 8th. And I hope you're doing well. So two quick things. Um, I have been getting a bunch of the 1990s film reviews from you and I've been going through reading those and grading them just to try to stay somewhat up to speed. Everything that, that's going on right now as far as, um, as far as all my classes, everything is taking three, four times longer because the, the transition to remote learning has, has definitely been a challenge. So I've been trying to stay up to speed on all the grading. So uh, thank you for submitting those. Uh, many of you are either done with your film reviews now or you only have maybe one left. Uh, and then I have a, a number of you who have apparently forgotten that you have to turn in film reviews this semester. So I have some some students who are probably gonna be disenchanted when they discover that, that it's too late to turn in uh, the film reviews for the decades prior to the 1980s. So guys, gals, I mean, just just things to be aware of. I, you know, try to be reminding you guys of all this stuff before all the, the crazy virus stuff happened. So that's, that's not a new, in, you know, new invention or a new development. One more thing, I've already reached out, but I have not received the, um, the full slate of 1990s or yeah, the full slate of the, the group members who were originally part of the 1990s group. Each of you guys is responsible for submitting a five minute independent video where you decide what the best film or the, what the greatest film from the 1990s is. And I have not received those to date anyway. Uh, those were actually due on on Monday. So I need you to get on that. I know things are a little nuts right now, but you need to make that happen. Um, I think that's it for right now as far as covering some of the overall course requirements. So let's dig back into some films. I'm gonna I'm gonna start gonna go back to yet a third a third Spielberg film for the 1990s. Uh, one of his big letdowns actually was The Lost World Jurassic Park, which was a follow-up to the original, which we're going to talk about in a minute. And Hook was, you know, I think a pretty interesting film. He kind of uh, went for broke on that one. And, and certainly there are some interesting set pieces and some, some interesting things he does there. But those, those were not nearly as well received for a variety of reasons uh, as our two masterpieces that we've already discussed, Schindler's List and Saving Private Ryan. Amistad is a very fine historical epic piece uh, dealing specifically with a slave ship called the Amistad. Some really great acting in that film. I don't wanna dismiss it as, a, as an unimportant film, uh, but I'm gonna, I'm going to talk about Jurassic Park instead here. So I, I do want you to be aware of Amistad. I would, I would definitely recommend it to you, and uh, it's worth your time. But the other film, the other Spielberg film from the decade that really did make quite a dent also came out in 1993, the same year of, of all things, the same year as Schindler's List. So he had a, a tendency in 1998 to, in 1990s and 2000s and, and whatnot, Spielberg had a tendency to try to do two films that were released in the same year. And then he would take, you know, a long break. And then the next time around, he would release another two films in the same year. I, I guess it was just kind of a, you know, a, a working schedule that he, he fell in love with for some reason. So the same year as Schindler's List, he releases Jurassic Park. And, you know, from the beginning, I mean, if you go back and watch Jurassic Park now, one of the things that you know, people who apparently have nothing better to do with their time, they go back and they try to, to look at the CGI from Jurassic Park and compare it to CGI from 2020 or what have you, right? Which I'm not really sure that, that that's a helpful exercise because you're not really comparing apples to apples. The, the CGI was still very much in its infancy in 1993 and Spielberg's film even now actually holds up remarkably well. There are a few scenes uh, even the scene with the brachiosaur, I think they just struggled to make that really uh, 
you know, really pop as something that that struck the audience members as genuine and real. But most of the scenes with the dinosaurs actually work really well. And, and I want you to just be aware of the fact that, of course, Jurassic Park is one of these benchmark films. It is, it's not only, um, it is certainly CGI rich because the dinosaurs were CGI creations for the most part. There were some, uh, some of the velociraptor scenes they used, you know, uh, partially robotic uh, raptors and a couple of those themes or, or puppets or things along those lines. So there, there were some of those things going on too, but, but especially for the larger dinosaurs, they use CGI. It is uh, it, in a, a number of ways, and I heard him talk about this uh, maybe a year or two after the release of the film, Spielberg created a film that is very much kind of, very much the, um, kind of like Jaws only with dinosaurs, right? And, and so he uses a lot of the same principles. If you watch through Jurassic Park and you watch through Jaws, uh, you know, he, he certainly tries to bring the audience along and build up the tension, build up, you know, the, the thrills for as long as he possibly can. And, and one of the great scenes where he does that, you know, we've been anticipating a number of, of really great dinosaurs throughout the film, but even when the characters come onto the island and they're being shown around the facility and they're, they're shown how the, you know, uh, you know, how the DNA sequencing exists and the eggs are being turned and all the rest, right? We're just anticipating our first real introduction to the dinosaurs. And I love that Spielberg just keeps stringing us along. And, and it's not because they couldn't show us dinosaurs, it's because he wanted to build up the tension. And he, he'd done that in a number of other films, including, of course, Jaws. And I love the sequence in particular when they finally get out and they're touring the park and they can't, <laughs> <laughs> to this point, they haven't been able to see any dinosaurs. <laughs> and the Jeff Goldblum character, doc, Dr. Ian Malcolm says, now there aren't going to be dinosaurs on this, you know, this dinosaur tour, correct? <laughs> uh, very, very dry humor coming from the Dr. Malcolm character. But this is how Spielberg has brought us to the brink, so to speak, as we're just, we're very, we're getting increasingly anxious. We know that the dinosaurs are finally going to be unveiled at some point, but we're really waiting for the, you know, kind of that shock treatment to happen. And the famous scene in the film is the one that I posted for you, where the two kids are in the, uh, the Ford Explorer vehicle with this other guy. And, and they, the vehicles have stopped outside of the Tyrannosaurus Rex paddock, right? And they're just sitting there, the rain is going, it's dark, and then they, they hear a sound. It sounds like a, a bit of a tremor of some sort. And then you see the famous shot <laughs> with the water glasses. And then there's another tremor. And, and this is how the audience is introduced to the Tyrannosaurus Rex creature in the film. And it's a very effective uh, way of framing that. So I really like what Spielberg does throughout the film. I, I do think it's, it's very, it's kind of a throwback. It's a throwback film for Spielberg. He kind of goes back to his roots with sci-fi, right? And he does a really fine job. I still think that, and that some of his earlier pieces, like uh, especially, I think, Jaws, but also Close Encounters of the Third Kind are are much more effective in some respects, and they're more, uh, I, I think they're more innovative in many respects, but I don't wanna rob Jurassic Park of its, its due, because I think it's actually a very good film, and definitely one worth watching. I suspect most of you have probably seen it. Okay. I'm not going to, I did not post a clip on these other two films here, but I, but I wanted to just mention them in passing. Uh, two other Scorsese films of the 90s deserve attention. Uh, one of them is Casino. It's another, uh, not a surprise because it's, deals, it's dealing with the Vegas Strip in, you know, the, 19, the 1950s and 60s and into the 70s. And um, actually most of it's in the 60s and 70s. Uh, but 
it's it's a definitely an epic film. So it's almost like taking what Scorsese has done before with these these epic films, historically featured films, and he's he's doing the same thing. Only he's looking at the the way that the mafia the mafia crime families run the Las Vegas strips, and he's using some some a couple of actual characters who were on on the Vegas casino strips for that period of time. It's it's a very well done drama. There's certainly some violence because of course you're dealing with with the mafia. Uh, the characters are very well rounded. They're actually pretty complex, and I I I really do like what he does in that film. Some of the same characters that some of the same actors that you would have seen in a film like Goodfellas from just a couple of years before. So we've got De Niro and Joe Pesci back again in a, in a different film, different characters, but actually very effectively done. Okay, the other film, which I think is more important, it's, it's, uh, it's not the casinos, a poor film, like I said, I think it's actually quite well done. But the other film that deserves an awful lot of attention that may not quite you know, approach the level of something like Goodfellas or some of the other Scorsese films, but it's it's right up there. It's very well done. And it's a film called The Age of Innocence, starring Daniel Day-Lewis and Michelle Pfeiffer and Winona Ryder. And it's a film about the Gilded Age in American culture. And it's a it's doesn't really seem like it's a Scorsese film, except for the fact that it is so gorgeously shot, the cinematography, the framing, everything, every last detail of the film, the costuming, the interactions, the modes of speech, everything is just so pitch perfect in this movie. And I love that Scorsese is, is trying to do something, and rightfully so, he's trying to unpack the idea that this, you know, um, this Victorian culture, although of course it's the United States, so most most Americans would not have been comfortable with that title. But we are technically in the Victorian age in this film, and you know all of the niceties, all of the the um, all the respectful interactions, all the ways in which people uh, chose to you know define respect and nobility and and admirability and all these things how how actually vacant a lot of it was and and how challenging and how in a some in a very real sense how dehumanizing and so he's looking at the middle and upper middle class and some some who might be considered upper class americans in this film and he's he's revealing their lives in a very interesting way and i would highly recommend it it is uh, it is one of the most, first of all, it's one of the most beautiful films you're likely to see. Just uh, gorgeous, absolutely gorgeous cinematography. And you also have powerful performances from, from all three of the leads. In particular, Daniel Day-Lewis and Michelle Pfeiffer give some of their best work to date to that point in their, in their um, acting careers. So Daniel Day-Lewis was coming off his kind of the the film that catapulted him to international attention, which was The Last of the Mohicans, where he played Hawkeye. This film comes out the following year. So he had just a, a sequence of really good luck when it comes to acting roles with particularly gifted directors. So those are two other films, aside from Goodfellas in the 1990s, Casino, The Age of Innocence from Martin Scorsese, I really would put at the top of your list. It's not that Kundun or Bringing Out the Dead or uh, Cape Fear are poor films. I personally didn't, I just didn't enjoy Bringing Out the Dead, but I did see some of what Scorsese was trying to do there. Kundun would, was just a film that uh, I, I struggled to, to pay attention for parts of it, which is never a really good sign for somebody like me. Cape Fear is actually a remake of a film from years before, and you know, it, it's just, uh, I, I'm not going to spoil it. It's it's sort of like Scorsese's attempt to do to to deal with uh, psychotic behavior, psychotic criminal behavior in the character of Robert De Niro, and uh, this comes on the heels, of course, of The Silence of the Lambs, which is a film that we're going to be dealing with a little bit later here today. So, of the the five films that you see here, the three that I think are most worthy of your time are definitely Goodfellas, but also The Age of Innocence, A Close Second, and Casino. 
Okay. All right, we do have to talk a little bit about Jim Cameron in the 1990s. So a couple of things for you. So he, he makes his breakout film in 1984 with The Terminator. He follows that up in 1986 with, I think one of the great sequels of all time, and that would be Aliens, uh, the sequel to the Ridley Scott you know, horror masterpiece, a sci-fi horror masterpiece from 1979. So those are great films. He also finishes the 1980s with a spectacular film that I think is underrated called The Abyss. But I, I think what we see with the 1990s is that James Cameron, who is, is on the rise, he's getting an awful lot of attention for his, uh, his capacity to take the the sci-fi genre and and bring some really interesting complex character development and also some visceral qualities to the forefront very effectively and he ups his game for a couple of films in the 1990s uh, really does a fine job with one particular sci-fi film and then branches out into drama historical epic drama with titanic which i'll get to in a minute so the Terminator 2 is obviously a follow-up to the film that catapulted him to, to the A-list directors very quickly. And it, it's, I think in some respects, it's actually a superior film to the original. Part of that is because he was given a much bigger budget by the studio, and he was able to, do, to actually integrate the visuals that he wanted to much more effectively. And he was really pushing the limits of all sorts of CGI work in Terminator 2, specifically with the new, uh, the new Terminator in the film. It's played by um, Robert Patrick is the actor's name. And, and Patrick was this shrimpy little, you know, he looked like he was about 140 pounds or something. Um, and he, in, the, in the film, he, he comes to, to that time period, right? He's sent back to, to kill John Connor, who's now a, a teenager. Uh, maybe a preteen, he's like 12, 13, something like that. And, um, you know, this, this new team Terminator, the T-1000, uh, is made of what we're told is liquid metal. And so this, this new Terminator requires all sorts of, of integrated CGI technology. And it was actually very impressive. And throughout the film, you'll see this, that the storyline is actually pretty complex. Cameron and his his production crew do a reasonably good job of bringing the audience along with this framework. Similar set piece as far as, as the, the evil Terminator being sent back to kill Sarah Connor and John Connor both. But now the, the plot twist, of course, is that there's another Terminator sent back, and this one has been reprogrammed by the future John Connor to protect the younger version of himself. And the, the Terminator that is sent back for protection measures is actually none other than a T-800 version that, of course, looks just like the Terminator from the first film played by Arnold Schwarzenegger. So Schwarzenegger reprises his role, in a sense, and yet his whole demeanor changes. His whole uh, mandate has been completely shifted in a 180 degree direction. And, and that's part of the, the reason that this film plays so well. And, and I really like that uh, James Cameron and his production team kind of zeroed in on this narrative structure because it actually uh, helps to distance it from the previous film. And it, it proves to be a remarkably dramatic way to connect the audience to these characters. And I, I posted a link because I just wanted you to see how, how clever even though it's pretty simplistic in some respects, I love how, how clever it is that Cameron has brought these two, these two different Terminators and he's, he's juxtaposed this very well. And the sequence that I, that I linked to the Converge page is just their initial meeting. So the Terminator, the Schwarzenegger Terminator, right? The protector is encountering this super advanced model, the T-1000 for the first time. And you see that, see the challenges that the protector Terminator is going to face throughout the film. So great film, I would highly recommend it. The other film from the decade, I, I chose not to post a link, but uh, you know, it's, it's easy enough to find and, and I would highly recommend you do watch the film. I think it's take, I mean, it's a fun film to, 
to kind of mock in a sense, just because there are some, some famous scenes that have been mocked over the years. But I think it's important to go back and, and look at the film Titanic on its own terms. There's a reason it won so many Oscars. Uh, it, it, was, it was really a revelation, and it's not that it's not that Titanic films or films about the Titanic had not been made before. Going back to probably the best one is A, a Night to Remember. Really, really well done film. So there had been a number of them before, but uh, nothing that was that was quite so impressive as far as the epic scale, the the uh, the technology itself, the con the set of the ship that was built, I believe, down in, in Mexico, um, a, a replica of the Titanic to a degree which they could, they could move around and flood with water and release the water and do all sorts of things with it. And, and then, you know, bringing in the plot line and trying to humanize this. And one of the things that I think, you, you know, audiences must understand, the movie watchers must, must understand, is that I, you know, audiences and critics alike really flocked to this film and really locked in on it because of the dramatic power that Cameron brings to the forefront. And it was, for, for me and for many others, I was actually surprised that James Cameron had been given the reins to this project. You know, he'd typically been doing sci-fi and action adventure films. And, you know, it was, it was definitely a bit of a, a shift for him career-wise. But he does a really wonderful job. Uh, he and his screenwriters carefully crafted this film, and they they didn't just make it about the ship itself and showing the ship, you know, in all of its grandeur, its glory, you know, the the largest moving object in the world in the history of the world to that point, 1912. Uh, they they dealt with the irony of the unsinkable claims. They deal with the the structure of society at that time, the class structure, the divisions between the super wealthy and the moderately wealthy versus those who were exceedingly poor, trying to make a new life in America, coming from various parts of Europe to do so. And, and all of this is done through the, the characters that are created. They, they embody these different sectors of Edwardian society, and they do so extremely well. And of course, this is a you know, a career making piece for Leonardo DiCaprio. He'd been in some other films and was really good in them. My favorite of his early films is probably What's Eating Gilbert Grape, where he uh, he he plays um, a, a mentally challenged boy. And he, he was so convincing in the role. I'd never really heard of DiCaprio before in 1993 when, when that film came out. Uh, he plays opposite a very young Johnny Depp in that film. And he was so convincing, I actually initially wondered whether they had they had found uh, you know a mentally challenged boy that was able to play this role, but of course it was it was DiCaprio, and he does an amazing job in that movie and got an awful lot of critical attention. But he kind of floundered through a few years, you know, in between, and then this role in 1997 just skyrockets DiCaprio to to the apex, and it really allows him to, to pursue projects that again, keep him hovering around A-list actors. And then finally he joins that pack, you know, by the end of the decade or into the 21st century. Kate Winslet is also a very, uh, you know, very fine performance from Kate Winslet in the film. I like her, some of her other films better. She's, she's, actually, um, she's actually really, really uh, gives a great performance in Sense and Sensibility from 1995. She's, uh, she's wonderful in Eternal Sunshine of the Spotless Mind. So there are some other films I would probably rate higher, but that's not dismissing Kate Winslet's performance in this film. It's, it's excellent. So the, the key characters give fine performances, but it's the dramatic element of this movie, bringing the, the human tragedy of the Titanic, which I, I think is so critical to lock in on. This, you know, this may have been a tragedy where you know, you, you think about 1,500 lives lost, only 705 people, I believe, were saved from the, the disaster. But it, it is it is just a horrific way to die. And, and the, uh, you know, just the inexplicable, um, the, this, these feelings, the, the passengers, after having been told that this was their, you know, their, the safest boat in the world that they could travel on, 
and that this was the start of a new chapter in their lives, a, a marvelous new chapter, and then they meet such a tragic end. I think it's really critical to, to understand that. And, and Cameron and his crew pull no punches. You see the, the horrific realities of, of a ship that's sinking in the North Atlantic in April in those absolutely frigid waters. And you know, even those who survived the actual sinking of the ship itself were left to, uh, to freeze to death in that water. And, and that, I think these are all very important things that James Cameron wanted to do and to memorialize this tragedy. And he does a very fine job with it. Uh, just in passing, I should just mention, uh, every now and again, I've seen this a few times over the years at Corbin. Students thinking it's really funny to wear a t-shirt that says, uh, Titanic swim team 1912 um, as some sort of a joke and I, I, I hope students I hope you guys can understand that that things like that although I, I know the intention seems harmless perhaps but you got to be better right we we, uh, we all you know human beings should be better period but I would I would expect that those who understand uh, you know the challenges of of our existence, <laughs> the, the challenges of humanity and the tragedies of humanity would be a little bit more careful, even though it's been 100 and, you know, 109 years, 108 years. This is definitely one of the worst tragedies of uh, the past, uh, one of the worst maritime tragedies of the past you know, century or so. So just something to be aware of. I don't know if you've ever, you guys have ever seen anyone wearing a shirt like that, but uh, I have and I've, I've just kind of reminded, you know, gently reminded students that it's really not in good taste. It would not be in good taste to wear a t-shirt that in some way mocked the, uh, the death of Jews during the Holocaust, for instance. We could go on, you know, there is a long line of, of logic here, but just something to be aware of. Random, random soapbox lecture for you there. <laughs> okay, let me move on. Okay, Tarantino. So three films in the 90s. Tarantino is a really interesting director and I want you to be aware of him. The only, the, the link I posted, I had, I was very limited because I'm not gonna be posting uh, film links with an, a whole slew of profanity or anything else. So I had, <laughs> had to be very selective when I did this. I posted a link to a, a sequence from Pulp Fiction, which I'll explain in a minute. Uh, he really gets his game, his his uh, career making uh, chance in, in the first film, Reservoir Dogs, um, and then follows that up with Pulp Fiction. Jackie Brown is, is a well done film too, but I wanna talk about Pulp Fiction because it's the one that gets the most attention. It comes out in what, 93, 94, I guess. And it's a really weird film, I'll be honest with you. First time I saw it, I finished it and I thought, well, it's a pretty violent film and also very strange. I'm not sure exactly you know, what, you know, what I was supposed to follow with this film. It is, as Brian Godowas has mentioned in his book that you guys read, and as Nancy Piercy, who's also both of those, by the way, both Godowa and Piercy are huge fans of Tarantino and particularly they're huge fans of that film. And there are a couple of reasons why. Uh, Mr. Gattawa at least began to explain some of that in, in the Hollywood World Views book. And I think he's absolutely right. One of, the, one of the first things you notice with Pulp Fiction is that it is framed in a very postmodern sense. And we see that throughout the film. Uh, there are so many different sequences where you're thinking, man, this just, what just happened and then what happens after, they don't seem to merge or match up very well. They seem to be very disconnected and abstract. And that's actually part of the point. So this is a this is a film where you have essentially a number of you have some tie-in characters, right? So the John Travolta character, the Samuel L. Jackson, the, the two assassin characters, they tie together plot lines. But a lot of the plot seems to be compartmentalized. And so you have these different things, different characters that seem to be unrelated that are experiencing some different narrative scenarios. What's really interesting about the film is you have these exceedingly violent engagements in, you know, in sequences of, of the film. And yet you have, again, very postmodern and surreal juxtapositions that take place. So the, the link I posted for you guys 
was actually a very famous one from the film, but, but it really brings to light this, this postmodern construct. So you're talking, you have a film in which, um, you know, you have exceedingly violent interactions in some scenes and murders taking place, vengeance murders, murders for people who owe somebody money, murders for the sake of killing in some cases. I mean, there's, there's an awful lot of violence going on. And yet you have these interesting sequences like the one I posted where the two characters in this, in that scene, it's the, the dancing sequence at, um, at Jack Rabbit Slim's where John Travolta and Uma Thurman famously get up on a dance floor and they're, you know, they're kind of grooving up there on the dance floor and having a good old time and seem to be, you know, seem to be in totally comfortable in their own skins and totally comfortable with the, the present, but also with the broader realities of their lives, which we already know are quite violent. And it, it's those kinds of sequences that, that really uh, prompted audiences and critics to, to dig into this film and to try to consider how Tarantino had brought these seemingly disparate, disconnected um, aspects of filmmaking and narrative into a, a very co shockingly cohesive and sensible format. The other thing I want to mention, and it's the thing that both Godowa and, and Nancy Piercy talk about, is the worldview elements in this film are actually uh, very interesting and actually very compelling. And the best sequence in the film, although it is definitely laced with plenty of profanity, so I did not post it, is one of the very last scenes where um, this young man and his girlfriend are are in a restaurant and they're they're trying to steal from the Samuel L Jackson character and he has this briefcase and and they're they're coming in there and trying to trying to um, rob him and rob the joint and so this this great interaction takes place and it's one of the best speeches in the film where the Samuel L. Jackson character talks to them about his, <laughs> he's gone through something of a, a personal renaissance in the film and he's, he's reevaluated his life and his conduct in the film. And so he's, he's kind of in this, he says to him, he's in this transitional period <laughs> and, that, and that they lucked out for that reason. But he talks to them about, about something very important and this is what Mr. Godawa brought up and Nancy Piercy has done this too. The, substitutionary atonement where the Samuel L. Jackson character says, you know, what you've done here deserves to be punished, uh, but I'm going to give you your life. And uh, I have, he, he tells him, I, I have literally bought your life and you need to go live in, in light of that truth, essentially. And and you trace back through the film and you realize that Tarantino has set up these revelations and uh, and these moments of realization very cleverly throughout the film. Now, uh, I don't want you to head into that film unawares. It is horribly profane. It is exceedingly violent. There is a scene with um, Bruce Willis uh, in there where he is, you know, sexually abused, where he's raped. Um, his boxer, his boxer character. So I, I want you to understand there are, there are some, some quintessential Tarantino moments. And what I mean by that is Tarantino is, he has a reputation for this that started in the very beginning. Um, he, he populates his film with an awful lot of, of violence. And, and he crosses the line in, in a number of his different films and heaps on the violence and sometimes heaps on the blood and the gore a little bit, right? So like the Kill Bill volume one in particular, um, man, he just, the buckets of blood in that film just never seemed to stop flowing. So I want you to be aware that that, that part of Tarantino's, um, his, notoriety that that is certainly on display at different moments in pulp fiction as well although i you know pulp fiction in my in my estimation is not uh quite 
quite as over the top with its blood and gore as a film like Kill Bill. Nonetheless, I just, I want you to be aware of that. It's a challenging film. It's not, not a film I would recommend for everyone, that's for sure. I think you have to be very selective. It would probably be worth, you know, having your, your thumb on the, the fast forward button or the skip button for a sequence or two or three in, in some of these films. But there are some really profound things that are being done too. Okay. Oh, David Fincher. All right, this this guy is one of the geniuses of, of the film world, although his, a lot of his films delve into some of the, you know, the, the dark realities of human experience. And what I would say is this, uh, something that's a reminder, so going back to what Brian Godowa writes in his book that you guys have read, Definitely, I would regard David Fincher films as kind of the uh, the counter to to a Christian worldview perspective, which is looking for you know recognizing challenges and darkness and difficulty, but but trying to think of redemptive frameworks and trying to build on a you know, much more of a glass half full mentality. Uh, Fincher doesn't do that. Fincher doesn't concern himself with trying to to dig deep and find encouragement and find ways to be, um, to, to validate tradition or to validate religious belief or value in those things. He is a thoroughly existential director and he merges a lot of postmodernism in with his existential themes. Uh, I would say that almost every David Fincher film, in fact, that, I, that I've watched all of them, all, all the David Fincher films are populated with this existential philosophical foundation. So the characters are, are almost always constructing, their, constructing themselves from the inside out. And they're, they're trying to decide where they fit in the world, how they will contribute, whether their contributions mean anything, whether their lives mean anything, um, whether there is anything to be objectively measured like good and evil and right and wrong. We see, we see this in a number of his films. And I think, I mean, he does this in, in such creative ways. It's one of the reasons that, that many flock to his films. But I would not, I, I'd be lying if I told you that I didn't find his films to be sometimes overwhelmingly dark, because they are. But there is some value in understanding the, the ways in which, um, especially secular existentialists and, and secularists in our postmodern world, think how they conceive of themselves, how they relate to other people, um, the, the ideas that drive that behavior and, and what, that, what that means for human beings. And these films by Fincher are definitely set up to do just that. Um, I, his first film that he was, he was given, a, his first big breakout film that he was given the Reigns 2 was Alien 3, and it was regarded as a bit of a failure. I, I think it's, that's overblown. That's an overblown criticism. It wasn't, it wasn't a great film. There's no, no, no doubt about that, but I don't think it was a failure. Two previous films prior to Fight Club, I want to mention Seven and The Game. Look, Seven is seven's about a serial killer who, who takes the, the seven deadly sins from the Bible, and he he goes around killing people. And these two cops played by Brad Pitt and Morgan Freeman and down in New Orleans are trying to hunt down and figure this, this whole thing out, hunt down this killer. And it's deep, it's dark, it's frustrating, it's, uh, it's disturbing, it, it will, you know, that's one of those films that'll throw you for a loop. But it's also uh, very thought provoking if you're able to watch through that film. Would not that is ne definitely not uh, for the light, you know. It's not a light-hearted film. It's definitely not for someone with a, a weak stomach. It's a very difficult film, but also uh, powerful in its own way. The game with with Michael Douglas in in the, the lead role there, about a, a troubled man who's who himself is going through an existential crisis as he nears his birthday, and is forced to, well, is asked he agrees to. Uh, to to play this very surreal game. And, and through the process of playing this game, um, uh, which, which is very complex, 
uh, he kind of rediscovers himself. I'm not going to go into that film too much right now. But the film I want to hone in on is Fight Club. And it is, it is a, both an existential and a postmodern piece all rolled into one. And I, I did post a clip on this. It's, it's actually kind of the introduction to the, the whole concept of the club itself, the Fight Club. And, you know, the joke, of course, is that that's almost always referenced in the film is that a, nobody can talk to anybody else about the film Fight Club because, right, so the rules of Fight Club. Rule number one, we do not talk about Fight Club. Rule number two, we do not talk about Fight Club. Uh, the, the Tyler Durden character famously says, played by Brad Pitt in the film. Uh, but actually, there's an awful lot to talk about with this film, and it definitely digs into the, these existential themes of, you know, who am I? Am, am I to be defined by uh, external forces, by society, by religion, by relationships, by expectations? Or conversely, as an existential, secular existentialist, do I instead define myself? And do I define who I am through action? What action is valid? What action is useful? What action helps me to understand myself? And this is, that's at the core of this film. And you learn a lot of things about the Edward Norton character and the Brad Pitt characters, character in the film, because um, both of these guys are, are obviously part of a generation, as Fincher presents it, who are struggling with their identity. And they are, they're searching for meaning and they believe that they have found it in this rebellious activity uh, where they gather together and, and uh, kind of fight it out and prove to themselves and prove to others that they have, that they have merit and value and guts and courage and virtue and, and all the rest. And, and the film also kind of descends into a bit of a surreal level with, with the robberies that take place and the, the actions these guys think they're taking or claim to be taking for the betterment of society. Um, it, it's, it's actually a really well done film, very thought provoking, definitely disturbing at times. It's a Fincher film after all. Uh, there is some promiscuity in the film to be sure. I would recommend again that you have your, your, uh, your remote handy and you can always you know, fast forward through some things or skip a sequence or something like that. That's not a big deal. But I do think the overriding messages of this film are challenging and they're meant to be. They're meant to, to have the viewer confront you know, what existence really is supposed to mean. And this is through a thoroughly secularized existential framework. Um, so I would say David Fincher has, has this reputation, a very strong reputation for making very provocative, philosophically rich and challenging films. And there is no better film that he does that in than Fight Club. Okay. Just in passing. So I, I'm not going to spend a whole lot of time on the Coen brothers. Um, three films really stand out in the 1990s, although Barton Fink, I think, is an underappreciated film. The Hudsucker Proxy is really, um, I don't know what they were doing in that film, to be honest with you. I'm surprised a studio uh, paid them to make that movie, but it is what it is. Three other films, however, uh, are phenomenally well done to the point where Joel and Ethan Cohen go from no namers, right? Nobody would have told you they'd ever heard of these guys, even in 1989, right? They go from being completely obscure, having achieved virtually nothing to being, you know, almost right away considered for some of the big film projects of the 1990s and moving forward. The first film I want you to be aware of is 1990s Miller's Crossing. It's a film, uh, it's a gangster film, uh, very, actually a very poignant and moving and dramatically complex gangster film that's, um, you know, that's set back in the 19, late 1920s and 1930s. And it's, it's beautifully shot. The characters are great. I think it's an underappreciated film. I would just put it on your radar and, and I would recommend that you watch it at some point. 
Fargo, okay, this far, many would argue that Fargo's, uh, you know, kind of the film for the Coens in the 1990s. And I think it's, it's one of the two that deserves the most attention. It's, uh, it's almost, it, it's kind of interesting in that it reminds me a little bit of, um, what was I going to say? I'm kind of losing my train of thought here. Oh, I know. So it, it's a film that sort of reminds me a little bit of the films we just talked about, right? So we just, with Fincher, it reminds me if we think about the the existential themes, the the dark characterization that we would find in a film like Seven, or even with the game or Fight Club, we see that there are some similar themes brought to the forefront in very postmodern ways in a film like Fargo, um, which which brings seemingly disparate individuals into focus as their lives converge, and there's you know there are a lot of violent resolutions in that film, uh, and and I there is there there is a lot of value in watching that movie. I don't want to dismiss it, but the film I want to focus in most heavily on is The Big Lebowski. It's, both of these films have a pretty large following. So if you're a fan of Fargo, I'm not dismissing your film out of hand. I think it's actually a really good film. But The Big Lebowski, there, there's, something, there's like this cultural phenomenon that took place in the wake of The Big Lebowski in the person of, of the dude, right? Of Jeff Lebowski, who is not, he never would would use his own name, right? Uh, the the character played by Jeff Bridges in the film refers to himself simply as the dude, and it's a really interesting framework. There's there's this convoluted plot line. This is what I would say about both Fargo and The Big Lebowski is that both plot lines are actually not quite as well tailored as as successive films would be with the Coens. They, they are still very early in their craft, and there are bits and pieces of both of those films, Fargo and The Big Lebowski, whose narrative plot lines are uneven, sometimes a little bit difficult to connect to or follow. They polish that up, and a lot of their subsequent films are significantly better in these regards. But that's not really the most important part with The Big Lebowski. It is uh, the, the way in which the, the character of the dude embodies, you know, w the way in which Jeff Bridges embodies that character and, and what the dude stands for, how he carries himself, how, how he manages to, extra to extract himself from ludicrous scenarios <laughs> in the film. And, uh, you know, the impact of his character is pretty interesting because I, he is both kind of a combination of a secular humanist and a new ager in the film. So there, there are elements of, pan, you know, of Eastern Orthodox monism in there. But really, I would, I would put the dude as, as an interesting cross between a secular humanist and a new age, new age pantheist. Uh, just the, the classic uh, you know, the classic lines from the dude in the film, the way he, he carries himself, the way he dresses, the way he interacts, the way he doesn't, or at least he tries not to let anything really get to him. Uh, he is very low key. He is, he reminds me a, a lot of the, um, of the friends I had in, in high school and, and early college who would still travel around the country watching The Grateful Dead. Uh, very similar personalities <laughs> and displays, and and this this film just has since the time it came out, it has it has been one of the most well appreciated films. And I think the reason is is has far less to do with the intricacies and details of the narrative of the plot lines. Those are just really nowadays when you if you go back and watch the film, those are just oftentimes ways to get us to our next scene with the dude and some dudeism that he that he frames, some idea that he he frames and that his his character delivers in some sort of uh, a dialogue. So uh, it's kind of interesting that that the Coens come up with this film. I don't think that either of those guys would have predicted that the Big Lebowski would be the film that has the uh, the, the longest legacy, the most 
the most uh, recognizable cultural impact. So even now you'll, you'll hear somebody say, if, if they reference the film, the dude abides, right? So the, the Jeff Bridges character has certainly made that kind of an impact. It is, it's definitely one of the most well appreciated films from the 1990s. Okay. I got to mention it in passing, um, Catherine Bigelow, really, first of all, it's important for us to recognize there just aren't nearly enough women directors uh, working in the 1980s and 90s and certainly before. In the decades from the 1920s on through the 1990s and 2000s even, uh, there, there were women directors in the West, in the Hollywood film industry, in the British film industry, but they were so few and far between. And they were not typically given the reins by studio execs to, you know, to shoot uh, their major films. So whenever we encounter uh, someone like Sofia Coppola, who I'll be talking about in, in the coming decades, and when we, whenever we encounter one of these artists and they're, they're working at a very high level and they're making films with A-list actors, obviously we need to, to acknowledge their work. And I think uh, Catherine Bigelow has really stood the test of time. She, her latest film came out in I think 2017, if I'm not mistaken, called Detroit. She has a, a long history of really, really good films. I think her best film to date, uh, honestly, is probably, uh, I, I do actually, I'm going to talk about Point Break in a second. So I, I think that's, that's one, of my, one of my films that I have a lot of fun talking about. But if I think about Catherine Bigelow's best work, Zero Dark Thirty, comes to mind as, as what I think um, stands out to me as one of her, her greatest efforts to this point in her career. So she's made some, some really, really excellent films. Um, the Hurt Locker is another one, by the way. So two films, two later films that she becomes known for. But uh, the breakout film is Point Break, and it's, it's really, it's almost... <laughs> It's, it's almost ludicrously uh, funny, right, to, to be referencing Keanu Reeves and Patrick Swayze in this bank robber heist, you know, crime thriller sort of a film. And there are some, some, some painful scenes throughout the film. The acting is, is often not what it should be, especially coming from a very young Keanu Reeves. This was 1991, so no one really knew Keanu Reeves for anything other than you know, Bill and Ted's excellent adventure at this point. So Keanu Reeves was definitely still figuring out what acting meant and, uh, you know, how to, how to frame his roles most effectively. So he's not great in the film. Uh, I, you know, the, the late Patrick Swayze, it's kind of nice to see him, you know, when I watch the film, it's kind of nice to see him in a film role where he was still so young and vital and, uh, before, of course, before he caught cancer and died way, way too young. Uh, but it, it's, it's one of these films w that a lot of us in the 19, early 1990s, you know, a lot of people went to see it in the theaters and they were pretty, pretty surprised by, by uh, how much fun the film was to watch. It's, some people I, I've heard say it's one of their guilty pleasure films. I don't know. I, don't, I think that phrase is kind of stupid, to be honest with you. I think it is what it is. It's a popcorn film. It's an action film. Uh, the, some of the acting in the film is not great, but it's not horrible. It's, it's just, you know, kind of average here and there. But overall, um, it's one of those, fil those films that, that a lot of us remember watching and, and thoroughly enjoying. And Catherine Bigelow, it's, it's the film that really gets her career jump started. So I at least wanted to mention it in passing. Okay. Um, Yes, I did want to talk about a couple of these films. So I posted another film on Converge today, and that's Hamlet. And the reason I did it is this. It's the Franco Zeffirelli version of Hamlet from 1990, starring Mel Gibson in the title role as Prince Hamlet. And um, Glenn Close plays his mother in the film. It's actually, it's populated with a whole slew of great actors. Ian Holm is in the film. Helena Bonham Carter plays Ophelia. So there are, there are a number of great actors and actresses in the film. Zeffirelli had made the 1968 version of Romeo and Juliet. And so he, he possessed 
um, you know, a real capacity for Shakespearean filmmaking, bringing those, those Shakespearean formats to the forefront visually and creating effective set pieces and really allowing the dramas uh, to, to play very well and, and almost seem like stage plays. And that's certainly on display here. There's another film. So the Kenneth Branagh version of Hamlet came out a couple years after this one in the 1990s. And for a time, many were, were still claiming, oh, it's so much better just basically because Kenneth Branagh's name was attached to it. And Branagh plays the, the Hamlet character in the film, by the way. But it, uh, for many, myself included, that version of that film version of Hamlet is is inferior to this version because it uh, really a, a lot of us struggle to connect with the Branagh film because it is it's much more opulent. It's visually stunning. There's no doubt about that. And it's not that the acting is bad. It's not like they are not delivering the lines from Shakespeare. Well, they are. But it was set in. Uh, what very much looked like Edwardian Britain, as opposed to, you know, so we're basically turn of the late 19th or turn of the 20th century Britain, right? As opposed to circa, you know, 1550 Denmark. So those are very different things. <laughs> and so uh, for a lot of us, the, the set the set pieces in the Franco Zeffirelli version, uh, the narrative structure, the visual structure with the area, with Denmark itself, with the characterization of the king and queen and Prince Hamlet in Danish culture as opposed to Western European culture, it all made a whole lot more sense. And I would also say, just in passing, uh, in my opinion, nobody plays crazy better than Mel Gibson. <laughs> uh, there are probably some reasons for that, which I won't dig into right this moment, but his, you know, his embodiment of Prince Hamlet in this particular version is phenomenal. The link I posted for you is at the very tail end where Prince Hamlet is having this, this duel. He's agreed to a duel and, and there's a plot against him and he's already uh, suffered the mortal wound uh, with a poisonous blade at the end of the film here that you'll see. And so it's that famous last, uh, the, the famous last interaction that Prince Hamlet has with courtiers and his friend Horatio, he famously tells Horatio, he says, uh, Horatio, I am dead. And, uh, and then Horatio gives his, his parting speech as Hamlet dies and he lies there on the floor. And it's, it, it's a great sequence actually to wrap up the film, uh, kind of bringing Zeffirelli's vision of Shakespeare, uh, arguably the greatest of all the Shakespearean plays. Uh, it happens to be, I, I believe it is, although I love so much of the other Shakespeare, love The Merchant of Venice, for instance, um, one of my favorites. I do like Romeo and Juliet and Julius Caesar. My other favorite is A Midsummer Night's Dream. These are These are just gorgeous Shakespearean pieces. They're so... They're so profound and wonderful. Uh, but Hamlet has always stood out for me. And I really, really enjoy uh, the Zeffirelli version from 1990. I think if you have not seen it, you'll really recognize some genius in the way that Zeffirelli brings that to the forefront. Okay, the other film that I want to hone in on is, uh, for today, anyway, the other one, the other link that I posted is from uh, the 1990, 1991 film, uh, Jonathan Dem. Uh, sometimes Americans call him Jonathan Demi, uh, but it's it's actually a French pronunciation. The the accent on the e is virtually silent. So, uh, 1991 film. The Silence of the Lambs, in which most audiences who hadn't seen a, a less known film by Michael Mann in 1988 um, had, had never been exposed to the, the Hannibal Lecter character before. But of course, the Lecter character is based you know, in, in novels. And so uh, this is the film that you know, brings Hannibal Lecter to American audiences and makes him sort of a household name. It got, <laughs> it got virtually universal praise and attention, both from audiences and critics. 
which is surprising considering the dark material, the fact that in a very real sense, although the protagonist you could argue is the young FBI agent Clarice Starling, played by Jodie Foster in the film, you could argue that she's the protagonist, and I would say that she is in a sense, uh, many audiences were most interested and most admiring of the Hannibal Lecter character played by the great Anthony Hopkins. And, and I'll be honest, at the time in 1991, I was, I was almost 20 years old when I saw it. And I just remember thinking, this is the, one of the creepiest characters of all time. And the subject matter is horribly deep and dark. This you know, the, the hunt for a serial killer who's, who's finding and, and murdering women and doing nasty things to them before he murders them. And, uh, and the decision by the FBI to go and ask advice from this incarcerated, you know, serial killer named Hannibal Lecter. And, and it's, it's definitely, I mean, I will tell you this, I, to this day, I'm not sure uh, how and why that film made such a, you know, such a, had such a flowering fan base as it did in 1991 because of the dark subject matter. But I will also say there's no doubt that the Hannibal Lecter character as played by Hopkins is magnetic in, in his own disturbing and weird way. And the, the link I posted for you guys is one of the more famous ones in the film where, where Hannibal Lecter is, is goading, uh, Jodie Foster's character is, is goading the young FBI agent, Clary Starling, into kind of interacting with him th while he's in his prison cell. And so he kind of makes fun of her West Virginia upbringing. And, and she, she, yeah, she kind of engages with them and, and does a little bit of, of intellectual boxing for a second. And, and then he makes the famous statement that you guys can see about fava beans and, and, uh, glass of Chianti wine. Uh, just a thoroughly creepy character that nonetheless you, you can't look away from. Now I will warn you, for those of you who are not aware, this just knowing the, the basic narrative plot structure, this is about a highly disturbed and disturbing serial killer, Hannibal Lecter, who uh, would, would uh, cannibalize some of his victims. So he would, he would eat he would cook some of the, the organs of his victims and eat them. Just a just ugh, disturbing, nasty, horrible, rotten stuff, right? Um, just be aware. You cannot have a, a film like that that does not have disturbing qualities and disturbing, disturbing sequences. So look, uh, if you have not watched that film yet, be aware may not be a film that you choose to watch. I, I rarely watch it, even though even though I, I think it's actually exceedingly well done. Uh, it is just over the top creepy, to be honest with you. But it's, it's one of those films of the 1990s that anyone and everyone would know, and most people probably saw at least once uh, you know, in their lives as a result of all the fanfare that it garnered in 1991. Okay, guys, for today anyway, that's going to be it. I will come back and I'll be posting the, the last Zoom lecture for the 1990s. I'll be posting that for Monday the 13th. So be looking for that. Keep up on your film watching. Remember, guys and gals, if you're part of that 1990s group, your assignment is to submit uh, independently, submit five-minute videos of what you decide individually is the greatest film of the 1990s. I think that's it, guys. I will talk to you soon. I hope you're doing well. Bye-bye.